You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Today's guest is Kristen Harmel, who joins us back on the show. So, so Kristen, um, when you were last on the show, um, you had this fantastic book out, um, the uh, Room on Rue Amale. W- what's been going on since then? There's, uh, you know, the the world has changed an awful lot, but you you had a book release between those. Um, tell us a little bit about it and what's been going on with you. Yeah, gosh, I, that's so funny. Um... I feel like I just talked to you, but if it, if, if it was for the room on <laughs> Ruamali, that was two and a half years ago now. I know, it's crazy. crazy. I mean, but what is what is time anymore, right? Exactly. I mean, it, it says it has ceased <laughs> to exist in any sort of normal sense. Um, uh, so, yeah, I had a book come out last year also in uh, 2019 called The Winemaker's Wife. Um, and then, of course, as you mentioned, I have a new one called The Book of Lost Names. And... Um, yeah, life has been crazy. I mean, gosh, this this pandemic, of course, has thrown us all into um, just a whole new world. Um, and um, it, it's been interesting to be finding such different, new, exciting ways to reach readers. Uh, I, I would I would love it to still be out on the road, but that's not possible right now. And it's been great to to realize that the internet offers us so many more experience or so many more opportunities than i realized to connect oh for right. sure um, um kristen, kristen you have you really, have found, really found, found your niche, niche. I, i'm hearing myself again i'm so sorry i'm like i i hear what and now it stopped and it's um it's, it's okay it's I, i'm not hearing it now what i i was hearing myself back and i was making myself stumble um kristen you've really um kind of uh, made a, a name for yourself uh, and, and kind of uh, found your niche in historical fiction. Do you remember the first historical fiction book that you read that just completely transported you to another place and made you feel like you lived in another time and, and could walk along with these other people? Gosh, that's a great question. I don't know that anyone's ever asked me that before. Um, Gosh, the first historical fiction book I rem- that I can remember reading that was that was intentionally historical fiction was probably Little House on the Prairie. Um, but I also read the whole, you know, when I was little, I read all the um, the Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys and Bobsy Twin books, and those weren't historical fiction because at the time they were being written, you know, they were they were written in the time they were written in, but. Um, you know, I was reading them in the 80s as as I was a young child, and I was reading the books that had been written, you know, probably 50 years before that, 40 or 50 years before that. So I guess that doesn't really make them historical fiction, but I felt very transported um, to that time and place just by virtue of the fact that the stories were happening in the past. But um, probably the book that transported me most was not fiction, um, but it was uh, The Diary of Anne Frank. And I read that probably when I was 11 or 12 and and it has stayed with me in my heart um since then i've read it numerous times since then um and and i think it is in large part responsible for the path i'm on now writing about world war ii so So, world war ii II, um historical fiction is really um found uh an audience uh these days The, the there are a lot of Great stories coming about coming out about this time period and these characters. What is it, do you think, um, that makes us as a reading audience, um, never mind writers uh, for right now, but as as readers, what is it, um, do you think, that makes us so hungry for these types of stories and like we don't want to lose these stories right now? No, that's so true. Um, you're right. I, I mean, World War II is really having a moment and has been for the past few years. Um, I, you know, for me, I think there are a few things that attract 
uh, people to reading about it. One is that um, we know who we're reading for, and that's a nice thing to feel when you go into a book. Um, it's probably the last obvious time in our modern history that there was a clear good and a clear evil sort of um mm. and and you know within that so within true. that right i mean and within that um obviously as a writer you have a lot of gray area to play in you know just because someone is you know on the you know has like the nationality of someone who's supposed to be on the side of good doesn't necessarily mean they're good or you know vice versa so like you know some there's there's so much gray area it's not just a formulaic way to put together a story but i kind of think um in a way it's it's the same reason that um that superhero stories work you know who the good guys are you know who the bad guys are and um and the satisfaction in the story is what unfolds in between once you have those parameters sort of set. Um, I also think that for the majority of people reading today who are picking up these kinds of books, um, maybe not the majority, but a, a very, probably, yeah, probably the majority, we have a connection in some way to World War II. So um, for me, it was my grandparents. My grandparents um, all lived through World War II and had, um, you know, experienced it in different ways. And all four of my grandparents um, are gone now. And while they were still alive, um, I didn't have the wisdom or maturity to ask them their stories. And so a lot of those stories died with them. Um, and I, I, that's something I find from a lot of readers. That's something a lot of readers say, that either they never asked their parents or grandparents those stories, or um, or their grandparents or parents experienced something so traumatic that they were never able to talk about it. So I think in a way, telling stories about that generation, you know, the, the greatest generation, um, is a way to reconnect with those people that uh, for, the, for the most part we have lost or are losing. You know, I, I know I think about my grandparents every time I sit down to write a World War II book. Um, and I also think that particularly now, particularly in the last five or six months, uh, these are stories that really resonate in a probably more so than they did before because, you know, the time periods certainly are not the same. World War II was a, a much more serious darkness than we have right now, right? Sure. But, um, but we're in a sort of dark period of our modern history. Um, and I think there's something that's really resonating with readers. Um, about reading stories that remind us that there's always light in the darkness and that there's always a way through. Um, you know, because th this, with the pandemic and everything right now, it, it's a tough time. And sometimes you feel a little bit hopeless or, um, or, or a little bit lost. And I think it's good to be reminded that people have faced much worse, have found the strength within themselves and have triumphed over it. Well, what's really, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my voice is cracking. Um, what's really interesting is that um, given the choice, uh, almost none of us would want to go back to the 1930s, 1940s. Um, I think societally um, we have evolved um, past a lot of things and worked out of a lot of, a lot of issues and things like that. But like you said, the, um, the, the bigger scale problems um, there was a, a simpler solution, even though it was an extremely costly solution. It was easy to look and say, these are the bad guys. These are the good guys. We must defeat the bad guys. And we're going to put all of these other things that we're wrestling with aside for a minute, handle this, and then we'll come back and address those. Um, maybe we, we kind of long for problems with simpler solutions in, yeah. in, in a way. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Problems with simpler solutions and a rallying cry that everybody can agree upon. Um, you know, one of my novels, uh, which came out in 2012, it was called The Sweetness of Forgetting. And one of the storylines in that novel was based on a real historical fact, which was that um, the Muslims of the Grand Mosque of Paris uh, helped save um, around a thousand Jewish people during World War II. Um, with the help of Christian organizations. So it was these um, three major religious groups that today, in today's world, 
uh, particularly the Jews and the Muslims are are clashing. You know what I mean? Like right. they, they're they're not for the most part working together. But here was a time in history where what humanity needed was so much greater than the things that divided them. Um, and and I think that's yeah. I mean you're right. I, we wouldn't want to go back to the 30s or the 40s for a lot of reasons. But that that was one reason because it was a the, this the simplicity of that need and of that just oneness of, of mankind, I, I think, um, is sort of enviable. Yeah. Kristen, we didn't get to talk last year, um, but you had a, a book come out called The Winemaker's Wife. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Sure. So The Winemaker's Wife um, was set in World War II Champagne, France, and also in the present day. And it's about... Um, Two women in the past who were connected to a champagne house, a, a prestigious champagne house, um, and a woman in the present whose grandmother has um, abruptly taken her back to champagne to reveal a deep, dark family secret. Um, and so you sort of see both stories unfold um, at once. Um, and it has to do with... Um, Sort of the tradition of champagne making, the spirit of champagne making, um, and what happened when the Germans arrived during World War II. Um, and, you know, I've written um, now four novels about World War II France, five novels about World War II. Um, and especially after The Room on Rue Amelie, which involved the resistance in Paris, I wanted to write again about the resistance, um, about a different element of it. But I wanted to get out of Paris. I just I wanted to explore a different area of France. And Champagne was it. I mean, Champagne has such a fascinating history. Um, I've read a quote that uh, says uh, more blood has been spilled on the earth there than anywhere else in the world. And that's such an interesting thing to know because we we associate Champagne with celebration. Um, but they, they're a tremendously resilient people. Um, just like their grapes are resilient. And that's kind of what makes such um, such phenomenal wine, one of the things that makes such phenomenal wine. But um, the stories I came across were really fascinating, such as the fact that the, the head of Moet et Chandon, one of the largest champagne brands in the world, um, the head of that uh, champagne brand during World War II was actually also secretly the head of the political wing of the French resistance in Eastern France. So he was responsible for dealing with the Nazis and dealing with their demands for champagne. Um, but he was also working to undermine them right right in front of them, right under their noses. So there were so many interesting historical tidbits like that, that it was a lot of fun to spin that into um, just kind of a, a fast moving story of family and betrayal and lies and redemption. <laughs> so all, all those things. <laughs> Kristen, there's been much written about World War II and the time and all of the players in and the, this grand uh, conflict that that played out, um, but I'm always fascinated by by writers like you who can take these um, these grand historical events um, that that we all know a lot about. We we you know there, there are people that can talk endlessly about the battles and and the um, the you know people the uh, strategists and and how this played out in this and uh, and. And we can just parse all of those things till, you know, till the cows come home. Um, but what I find really intriguing uh, by your books is that you take these events, but you find a person um, that you can focus in on. And then how did this look to this person through his or her eyes? Um, what else was going on in the world? How did um, these uh, seemingly mundane things clash with these big, epic, you know, world altering events. And that's where real drama comes from, where where we can relate to a character or a handful of characters and then see these big epic scale things and how they affect what could be you or me. Um, how do you go about finding these people, these stories that then um, you know, trigger, you know, the, the writer's brain and the, the storyteller in you to, to then, you know, kind of launch into these, uh, epic tales. Well, um, thank you, first of all, for saying all those things. I mean, that's, that's, uh, it's one of my favorite things about writing this type of fiction is you almost have kind of the opportunity to tell two stories at once. 
um, because you're telling the broader story that is the historical story, um, you know, which is all rooted in fact, and we know the outcome, and it's no secret how World War II ends. Um, But then the personal stories, I think, are what, as you said, what connect you to it and what make you interested and, and, you know, what make you feel drawn in and what make you feel um, emotionally connected. So um, how do I go about finding the stories? Um, Just a lot of research and a lot of reading. And I think about the things that intrigue me. Um, So, for example, with The Winemaker's Wife, it started with that idea of I want to I would like to write about the resistance again. Um, I would like to not write about the resistance in Paris. I want to, you know, I want it to take place elsewhere. Um, Where should that be? And I started just reading. And um, it it was after reading a few books um, about uh, about Champagne, um, about what happened there during the war, um, you know, finding some documents, finding some interviews with people, things like that, uh, that I knew I had the basis for a story. So it, it, I think it comes from an idea of what if, and then I do the research to find out if that what if is, um, is possible as a, as a basis for a story. Um, and, uh, and, you know, w- once I have that and I, I begin nailing down the historical facts and as I'm nailing down the historical facts, which kind of creates the framework, um, I, I'm also mentally beginning to sort of figure out who the characters are going to be and what's going to happen to this, you know, huge historical backdrop. Um, and then once I kind of have that framework down, it's a lot of fun to, um, to sort of start from scratch with characters I have a vague idea about and just put them in motion in this world where the stakes are high and they have to make um, enormously important personal decisions that will change the world, that will change their world, but that will change the world around them too. Your new book, The the Book of Lost Names, um, has one of the most interesting characters that I've ever seen uh, in, in the character of Ava or Eva, um, however you pronounce her. Um, but to me, she's Ava. Um, <laughs> Ava, you're right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, she She has a fascinating story, and she's based on a real historical figure. Is that right? Well... Yes and no. So she's based on sort of a, um, a, a, a blend of several real life forgers, but there is, there was not a real Ava. Gotcha. Um, it was, she was basically a combination between, um, two resistance forgery networks, um, and, and the way that both of those networks worked and the way that people found their way into those networks and and things like that. So how did you, kind of stumble on to these forgers and 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 what was a forger back then for people that don't know well okay so um it was actually while writing and researching the room on rue amelie and the winemaker's wife that i began to wonder um about the role that forgers had played in the war and whether that would have been or whether that would be something that would make an interesting novel so um in many countries, but specifically in France, uh, which is what I kind of specialize in writing about, uh, the resistance was greatly aided by people who made forged documents um, because there were a lot of people trying to escape. There were a lot of Jewish people trying to escape. Um, there were a lot of allied pilots who were shot down and were trying to escape. Uh, there were a lot of um, young men and women who were part of the resistance and whose cover was blown, you know, who were who were uncovered and had to escape. But you couldn't um, just hop on a train with no identity papers um, or or try to trek through an urban area on your way somewhere else with no identity papers because you'd be arrested. I mean, you had to have papers that showed who you were, um, that you were an appropriate person, you know, in in the German perspective, um, and that you were, you had a a right and a reason to be going where you said you were going. Um, And that's where forgers came in. So um, if you wanted to hop on a train, if you were an escaping Jew um, and you wanted to get out of Paris, for example, you would need um, false documents. You would need um, false identity papers. You would need um, you would need a false travel permit uh, stamped by the Nazis, stamped and and, um, filled out in German. Um, You would need uh, supporting documents because it wasn't enough to just have those because those were the things, you know, it it would be common to have those forged. But you also needed a ticket for 
riding your bicycle with the headlight off that the police, you know, that the police had issued to you or a library card or, you know, whatever, like other little things that supported your identity um, that were less obvious. And, and that's what forgers did. Forgers figured out how to forge those documents and how to make them look real and how to give you a real person's identity or an identity that would hold up to inspection. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was while researching those two previous novels that I thought, what did forgers do? Um, is, would this make an interesting story? And I, I began, like I mentioned, I just begin by doing a ton of broad reading. And um, I stumbled across two forgers in particular whose stories have been written. Um, one is a man named Adolfo Kaminsky. He was an incredibly prolific forger in Paris. And the other one is a man named Oscar Rosowski, who was a very prolific forger in, um, in uh, the south of France. Um, and both of them together were responsible for saving thousands of lives. Um, and they were both just young Jewish men who had forged their own papers um, for themselves and for family members to escape, um, wound up being good at it um, and learned as they went and, and wound up, I mean, really being heroes. And I was just fascinated by this idea that these weren't men standing with a, a you know, a, a weapon at the battlefront. These were people with intelligence and imagination and artistic ability who found a way to make an enormous contribution to the cause. Um, and, and I love that. It was a really interesting story to research. Absolutely. Um, when we when we meet Ava in the book, she is uh, an American librarian. And I, I find it interesting that there are so many um, characters in in this story uh, of World War II that um, eventually uh, settled in in uh, other Western countries, uh, the United States, uh, Britain, Canada, uh, yeah. maybe, and and they um, their lives take a, a whole other twist and turn. And if you didn't know this history, you would never know that they were tied back to this time and, and this place. But there's there's a, a magazine that immediately takes her back. Um, tell us about kind of what your idea for this instigating factor to pull her back into her say, her history. Well, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, and you're right about so many people having um, left the places where they had sort of this trauma um, and, and moving somewhere new to sort of start over. And you know, I think a lot of people did start over and just never really talk about the past again. But um, the inspiration for that storyline, and so the, the present day storyline basically focuses on Ava trying to return um, or trying to summon the courage to return to find the Book of Lost Names, which was this book that was very important to her um, that was stolen 60 years prior um, when the Nazis were pulling out of France. Um, and the inspiration for that was a New York Times article that, um, that I read. I think it was the, around the beginning of 2019, my literary agent forwarded it to me. And it was about um, the fact that in Germany, um, there are still millions and millions of books that were stolen, that were looted from people during the war that have not yet been returned to their rightful owners. So for example, in the main um, central library in Berlin, um, they have about three and a half million books in their collection. And they estimate that more than a million of them were looted books. Um, and, you know, there are people working tirelessly to try to return those books to their rightful owners, but it's been 75 years now. Um, and, and not all of the books have um, have obvious sources or, or obvious provenance. So um, so it's it's a real challenge. And I was fascinated by that. But that's what triggers Ava um, to basically go down this road uh, toward this past she spent the last 60 years avoiding because she sees this book that had once belonged to her um, that was looted a long time ago and that she thinks might contain um, a, a last secret coded message um, that she's been wondering about for 60 years. Um, she sees it in the, in the New York Times and she wonders, you know, can I go after this? Do I have the courage? Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's the journey we're along on with her. We know that the Nazis perpetrated all manner of atrocities, uh, but for some people, uh, they're just learning that book thievery was among them, and people are getting mad all over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, was was the Book of Lost Names, is that a real book? 
Um, so no, but sort of. So, um, so okay. the Book of Lost okay. Names, which is at the center of the novel, um, is basically a, um, a nondescript 1732 religious text, French religious text. Um, it is basically just a, a Catholic guide to the weekly masses. Um, and in the story, Ava and another um, prolific forger named Remy work together in the, um, the library, the small sort of hidden library of a rural French church, or not rural, but like in, in a very small town, a, a small town French church. Um, and when they decide, so what the Book of Lost Names is, is again, just this random nondescript book that they've chosen to use to record the name of the names of the children who they're forging documents for. Um, so Ava, Ava becomes a forger, Remy is a forger, um, and their main responsibility in their network is to forge documents for Jewish children who are being sent on, hopefully, to safety in Switzerland. Um, but Ava becomes very concerned that these um, these children uh, won't know who they are. Um, it, you know that they'll be too young to remember when the war is over because some of them are very young. And so, in order to prevent them from being erased and you know prevent their pasts and their heritage from being erased, she begins encoding their names in this nondescript 1732 religious book, um, which she begins referring to along with Remy as the Book of Lost Names. So that part of the story is fictional. Um, the code they use is based on a mathematical code called the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and I had a lot of fun uh, designing how that would work and how it would work in the book and whatever. But um, when I said yes and no about the book being a real book, um, I say that because I actually base that book on a real 1732 French religious text that I have. So I didn't want to just invent a book and then make up stuff on the pages. I have a real leather bound, beautiful, um, you know, tattered cover, gild, you know, gilded spine with most of the gilding, you know, having worn off over the years. Um, it, but it, it is the book. It's, it's the book of lost names. It's just that there wasn't a real life code in it. Um, and uh, so every time I mention a specific page, like if I were to say on page three, they drew a star over the, um, the O in two and the um, the V in, and a dot over the V in VU or what, you know, whatever. Um, right. I, I was doing that on page three of the real book. Um, and so that book sat beside my desk for the whole time I was writing the novel. And every day I put a hand on it and said, you know, like, this is my connection to the past. This I can imagine someone holding this in 1942 in a little French church library and feeling like this was the only way to make a difference. Love that so much. <laughs> when when you're writing the the sort of dual timelines, uh, we've we've got Ava in modern times, and then um, her recollections, her her flashes back as we're we're living through these uh, events uh, of of World War II with her. Um, when you shift gears to write the flashbacks, um, do you? Uh, is there something that changes in your writer brain? Do you prepare yourself? Okay, now I'm going to be a 1943, or you know, as opposed to you know, 2019 or 2020. Um, do you approach the writing those scenes differently? No, that that's a good question, but I I really don't. Um, you know, I know some writers who write um, dual timelines, um, write the time write the two stories completely differently, or you know, completely separately. They write the modern day timeline and then they write the past timeline, and then later they weave them together. I'm a very linear writer. I start at the beginning of the story. I look at it as a, um, a, a linear trajectory of the story as opposed to a, li a linear trajectory of time, if that makes sense. Sure, so, sure. Um, so I, cause I, it, to me, it's all about how you tell the story and how you weave them together. Um, you write so it I like I would read it. What, 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 yeah, you write exactly. Write it like you're like you intend for it to be read. Exactly. Um, so no, it, it actually, I, to be honest with you, I feel more comfortable writing the past, um, the, the story set in the past. And I think maybe that's because um, I feel like I've done so much more of the work. I mean, because in the present, you just sort of, um, it, it's not hard to imagine a modern day library. I mean, I, I don't have to find out like, well, how did the light switch work in the library? Or, you know, it's like these things <laughs> right. that like, we just obviously, it's in the modern day, we know how the light switch works. But, um, but in, in the past, I feel like I, maybe I just have more confidence because I've I, I have done everything I can to frame that world. And I also think that maybe 
that story develops as I'm doing the research, which means that even if it's not on paper yet, half of the story is already there in my head before I begin to sure. write. Um, so actually, those are, I think, the easier chapters for me to write. And and the only ones I really need to um, prepare myself for, or sort of brace myself for, as as um, as you were sort of saying, I think are the ones where um, where something really sad or tragic happens. Like those are those are the ones that are difficult for me because I have to get through them emotionally myself. Um, and, but I have to do it in a way that doesn't shy away from the tragedy or doesn't doesn't diminish it. You know. That's a great answer. Um, Kristen, we've mentioned uh, a couple of times as we've been talking the the pandemic that's going on and how life has shifted and changed for so many of us. Um, you know, when talking to writers every day, we um, writers can be kind of a, a strange bunch. You know, we we occupy a, a room uh, alone a lot of times to writing books and a lot uh, of that time is is just spent alone um writing with either a a, a computer or a, a notebook whatever whatever your method is and uh not a lot of interaction uh with other people and so you would think that a time like the covid-19 pandemic would be a great time for writers um <laughs> but as i've talked to people there there's kind of a, a a weird mental thing that is going on with a lot of people and um even though uh, you know being told you have to quarantine is different than working alone in a room, uh, you know there, there's yeah. something that's that's kind of going on with people. How have you um, personally uh, approached this time, and and do you feel like it's had any effect on your creativity? Well, um, I I feel like the writers who um, who are alone in a room um, with all their thoughts and their creativity are probably not the ones who have a four-year-old son like I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, that, that's been the biggest change for me. I mean, he's not, a, he's not in school. He normally, you know, it, it, he, we went on spring break in March and then he never went back. Um, right. And uh, so it is, and that used to be my writing time. He would go to school and I would write. Um, and uh, now I'm having to, um, to, pull the time out of nowhere to do that. Cause I, I mean, I, I, I can't do it when I'm looking after him, you know what I mean? Like he's, right. it, you, you, you can't just say to a four-year-old entertain yourself for the next three hours and, and they just cheerfully do it. Like it's just, unfortunately it doesn't work that way. So, um, uh, so for me, the biggest challenge has been, um, trying to figure out the time to do this. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting. I hope you don't mind that I tell this story, but it, I was thinking it was sort of funny as you were saying that, you know, writing is such an isolated thing because it, it is. Um, and, and COVID, the, the pandemic is an isolating thing and it is, sure. but um, this is the, uh, this is the time in my career that I have felt more connected than ever before to the community of writers and readers. Um, that's and that's amazing. because um, along with four other writer friends in uh, April, at the beginning of April, we decided to start a Facebook live show. Um, we started April 15th. Um, we thought we were going to go, you know, we, we do it once a week. We thought we were going to go until the end of May because surely things would be normal by the end of May. Um, and clearly they were not. Um, but even if they had been, I think we would have kept going because we, um, it, it, it's been, I think, game changing and life changing for all five of us. So it's a show called Friends in Fiction. Um, it's on Facebook live every Wednesday night at 7, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, and it's me, Mary Kay Andrews, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe. And so um, we chat with each other. We have guests. We've had people like Delia Owens and Kristen Hanna um, and Karen Slaughter and Ellen Hildebrand and Jasmine Guillory. And um, we have Emily Giffen coming on in a couple of weeks. We have Christina McMorris this week. Like we just have this amazing. Um, so fun. really fun lineup of guests. And a lot of them, some of them are people I've, I'm already friends with. Some of them are people I haven't met before. Um, and I'm getting this just extraordinary opportunity to connect with them. Um, and in addition to that, the, this Facebook live we do lives in a Facebook group we have called friends in fiction, which started off just a, you know, a couple dozen people. And, um, we've grown to, um, almost 17,000 members now. Um, which is great. It's become this wonderful place to connect with readers. Um, you know, every day there are hundreds of posts from people about what they're reading and what they're liking and what they aren't liking. And 
um, it's fascinating. I, I've never felt so connected to other writers and um, and to the people who are reading our books. It's it to me, it's been absolutely hands down the best thing that's come out of this uh, this pandemic time, um, and, and the most unexpected thing. But um, in terms of staying creative, it's those four writers who keep me on track. Um, I was floundering. I uh, I didn't know how to find the time. I was having trouble holding myself accountable because life has gotten hard, you know. Um, and uh, as a group, all five of us, we get up early every morning and write together in the morning before the world around us wakes up, before everyone else starts. So um, uh, I usually start at about six. Um, everyone is always there by seven. It's Mary Kay, Mary Kay Andrews usually who says go. <laughs> and, and we just write together until we have to begin our days. And um, that is the one thing that has kept me productive. So I write early in the morning um, and then I write on weekends and um, and I've, I feel like I've um, I've gotten my my writing mojo back. <laughs> that is so amazing. I love that. Find your tribe and and plug yeah, in. Absolutely. That is so fun. Well, the new book is called The Book of Lost Names. Uh, it's available everywhere now. It's been out for about a month. You can get it in hardcover or Kindle edition or audio book. Um, your audiobooks are just amazing, uh, by the way. I don't know. Um, audiobooks have been one of the biggest growth markets in in publishing of the last couple of years, even they've been even though they've been around forever. Um, but how fun is it to to hear your work um, translated in, into audio form? It's great, um, and and it's neat because my last few have been um, from Simon and Schuster Audio. So my my books are my you know physical books are published by. Um, by Simon, an imprint of Simon & Schuster called Gallery Books. Um, and so Simon & Schuster Audio has bought the audio rights, and so we work with them. And they're really wonderful in, the, in that they let me be a little bit involved with the process, in that I'm, um, I'm consulted about the narrators, um, and they ask me um, about pronunciations. So for character names that they're not sure of, they, they come to me and say, how would you pronounce this? They send me a whole list. Um, and I love that because... Um, because I think as, as the writer, that would be really upsetting to hear um, names pronounced in a way that I know I know isn't correct or places, you know. So they're really good about getting the details right. Um, and uh, so one of so the narrator of the Room on Rue Amelie in 2018 was a really talented audiobook narrator and also actress named Madeline Maybe. Um, I might be saying her last name wrong. It's M A B Y. Uh, but she's she's awesome. I, I loved her. I loved that that audiobook version. And for the winemaker's wife, when they sent me the options, she was one of the options. And I think that one had, if I'm remembering correctly, three narrators, because it's from three different viewpoints. But she was one of the options for one of them. And I was like, yes, I want her again. Um, and then when they sent me the options for um, for this audiobook, I listened to all of them. And on all, any of the narrators would have been great. I mean, they always start off with ones, um, you know, that, that, are, that would be really good fits for the characters. Like, that's one thing Simon & Schuster Audio does very well. But once again, Madeline was on that list and I was like, I can't not. I mean, she's amazing and she does <laughs> such a good job. And um, I, I was just thrilled to work with her again. And so we've exchanged a few um, a few messages on uh, on Facebook, you know, where she has said, you know, I love the book. And I've said, I love your narration. And, you know, I think we just have like a little bit of a um, just a little mutual mutual fan club, <laughs> which is nice. But I, I like her a lot and I've been really happy with the audiobook editions. That's amazing. You know, I have some friends that write epic fantasy uh, books, and uh, I've heard a couple of horror stories where they didn't get to communicate with the narrator ahead of time. And you've got some of these fantasy names with just a lot of consonants shoved yeah. together, and you, it, it doesn't turn out well. well and <laughs> yeah. those, are the, those are the names that you can't that, – that the, the audiobook production camp company can't just say, well, it's this, because it's like, no, it came out – it came out of the writer's brain, so you actually <laughs> right. can't say what it is. You have to ask the writer, right? So much fun. Well, the book of lost names is out available everywhere now. Um, Kristen, will you tell people where they can find you online if they want to connect with you and this amazing new show that you're doing? Where can people find out about yeah, that? Yeah, um, thank you for asking. So um, on Facebook, um, I'm Kristen Harmel author. On Twitter and Instagram, I'm Kristen Harmel. And that's Kristen with an I N K R I S T I N Harmel, um, and um, friends and, and my website is kristenharmel.com, and on and friends in fiction, which is the show I mentioned, um, you can find out about us at friendsinfiction.com, 
but we do, and that's friendsandfiction.com. Um, but we do our live shows on um, on Facebook uh, within our Facebook group, and you have to join the group to be able to see the live show. Um, and it, it, just to find us, look for Friends and Fiction on Facebook. You'll you'll see us pop up. We're the group with almost seventeen thousand members, um, and uh, and it's great. It's Wednesday nights, seven p.m. Eastern. Um, we have an amazing fall lineup. I mean, it's I, it, I'm just like. We haven't totally announced it yet, so I can't say it here, but it is people you're not going to believe. Like, it's it's so great. So if, if you like reading, it's um it's a really great place to come and interact with other readers, and it's a great place to come and get a behind-the-scenes look at um, at the people who are writing uh, writing books that are popular right now and that are, uh, you know, to find out about different people's writing processes and, and, um, and you know, kind of just what goes on with them in their daily lives as they're writing. Love it. We will uh, include links to all that stuff and make it easy for people to find uh, all those places and to find you. The book again, The Book of Lost Names. Go grab it everywhere today. Kristen, this has been so much fun catching up. Thank you for taking time to come back on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was so nice to talk with you again.